Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a grab bag list of 10 very curiously titled works. But they're not just funny titles. They're funny titles of masterful works because the musical universe is full of stupid titles and full of titles in which the most interesting about the music is the title and the music is kind of like, well, not, not so much. But here we have 10 masterpieces that have rather amazing names. And I just wanted to throw the list out there. I know that you probably have your own. I am more than happy to hear what you think about your curiously titled masterpieces. And there are tons of them, tons of them, tons. But this is just 10 that I sort of compiled off the top of my head just for fun so that I could throw them out there. And if you find these titles curiously intriguing, you might want to listen to the music. And it's all over the place. We've got orchestral works and chamber works and, and even an opera in here somewhere. Yes, we do. Oh, it's all kinds of stuff. So here's 10 weird names, but music that lives up to them. Number one, C.P.E. Bach's Trio Sonata in C minor, subtitled... Gespräch zwischen einem sanguinius und melancholicus, which is a conversation between a cheerful person and a dismal, droopy, unhappy person, a melancholy person. Now this is, like I said, it's a trio sonata. It's for two violins and continuo. So the two violins, one of them is happy and one of them is sad. One of them is muted and one of them isn't. It's, it was an experiment. And it's an amazing work because C.P. Bach gives you the emotional affect of every single bit, every phrase. It's a conversation. So-and-so makes a proposal. So-and-so answers. They're happy. This one's best sad. This is the, you know. And they go back and forth like that for several movements. I'm eventually reaching a kind of harmonious accommodation. But it's, it was an experiment that C.P.E. -E, Bach, C.P.C.E., C.P.E., C.P.E., Carl Philip Emanuel. Bach kind of regarded it as a failure. He wasn't entirely convinced by his own, you know, programmatic intentions. But you get to hear it and decide whether you think he made it or not. Sometimes it's just called sanguinius und melancholicus. But one way or another, it's an extraordinary piece and a wonderful example of, of, Baroque slash classical affect in music, how to create emotional expression in music through ornament and melody and harmony, really kind of a cool thing. And not as well known as it ought to be. It really is just a delightful work. So there's that. Next, well, this one is kind of obvious, but I had to throw it in because I think it's a work of genius. P.D.Q. Bach, AKA Peter Schickley, Iphigenia in Brooklyn, one of the great faux baroque cantatas for countertenor and an orchestra that consists of strings and double reeds. That is double reeds without oboes and bassoons, just the reeds. Oh my gosh, what a riot this is. Of course, Iphigenia got around. Iphigenia was, was in Taurus and was in Aulis in two separate Gluck operas, she pops up all over the place in Baroque music. And so because she seemed to be traveling regularly, uh, P.D.Q. Bach stuffed her into Brooklyn. Um, and since I happen to live in Brooklyn, I'm moving out of Brooklyn, but I sort of live in Brooklyn, it's still here in Brooklyn, I thought that I would do something for the hometown team, the hometown team. She lived right down the street at the Barclay Center on that site, that's where you could find Iphigenia. The title is great. I mean, it's just great. It's such a wonderful send up of all of the Iphigenia operas and cantatas and things that you find throughout the period. So Iphigenia in Brooklyn definitely, definitely gets the job done. It's music that certainly lives up to the title. And if you don't know it, and if you don't know your PDQ Bach and you're a classical newcomer, He's one of the great classical comedians in the world who wrote funny, funny, funny takes, send-ups on the classics. And the more you know the classics, the funnier it gets. And the performance with 
John Ferrante, the bargain counter tenor. I mean, nowadays with period instruments and counter tenors all over the place and all that, when PDQ Bach or Schickele wrote this, it was, it was very sort of esoteric. But now, oh my goodness, it seems more topical than ever. So I had to stick it in there. Number three, Rossini, Mon Prelude Hygienique du Matin. My hygienic morning prelude. In other words, something you can play and get up. And it's squeaky clean. I mean, it's in C major. It's squeaky, squeaky, squeaky clean. It's a solo piano work. It's one of Rossini's sins of his old age, many of which have very funny titles like, you know, Oeuf, les petits pois, or Oh, the green peas, and other things like that. They're very, very humorous, but also brilliant musically. You know, Rossini is one of the great composers for the piano in the second half of the 19th century, decades after he gave up composing operas. And his Sins of Old Age, which he amassed into like 15 volumes in his old slew of them, um, create you know, constitute an amazing artistic legacy of witty, diverting, enjoyable music written just for pleasure, for itself. And his, his hygienic morning prelude on all the white keys, more or less, is just a fantastic way to get started and an entree into a whole wonderful world of music. Um, it's Parisian salon music, elevated. Fantastic stuff. So that's number three. Number four, well, while we're in Paris doing strange Parisian salon music and things, we have to do something by Eric Satie. And there are a zillion choices because he was famous for coming up with particularly zany titles for music that once you hear it really is kind of, you know, sort of innocent and charming and then full of fun. Um, you know, I was really torn between the six flabby preludes for a dog, um, which is, you know, which are self-explanatory, six flabby preludes for a dog, or the piece in the form of a pear. Um, but I chose Embryon Desséché. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Desséché. That's six, des that's not six, pardon me, three, desiccated embryos. And the reason I chose desiccated embryos is because well, there are three of them. It's because the titles of each of the desiccated embryos are just as bizarre as the general desiccated embryo title. You've got the desiccated embryo of a holothurian, a holothurian, and then you've got the, the holothurian is like a sea cucumber. I mean, these are Latin names of sea creatures, strange sea creatures often. And then we've got the desiccated embryo of a idriophalma, an idriophalma. That's like sand lice or something like that. You know, another crustacean critter sort of thing. And then we have the desiccated embryo of a podophoma. That's like a lobster or something like that. It's something with eyes on stalks that crawls around. And they are, I mean, they are charming, delightful pieces. Anything desiccated or embryonic about them? Not that I can tell. But boy, that title's going to grab the attention, isn't it? I give it, give yourself a, a a shot at your desiccated embryos. You won't be sorry. Then, oh, I love this little work, George Crumb, Mundus Canis, a dog's world. Yes, Latin always makes everything sound so sophisticated, doesn't it? I remember I had sort of a a, a discussion with with Richard Daniel Poor. It was a discussion about. One of, one, of, one of his works, it was called, uh, oh, what was it called? Um, oh, uh, oh, I forget what it was. It had, it had this, 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 this pretentious Latin title. And I said to him, I said to him, you know, he gave me this whole business about how, you know, he wants, he wants his music to be approachable and, and listenable and, you know, audiences to immediately respond to it, all of which is lovely. And I said, well, if that's how you feel, um, why, why do you give it? you know, a pretentious Latin title. Why not just call it what it is? And he gave me a look that was like, you know, well, you know, what the hell am I doing with this guy? <laughs> it was not a happy interview. But, you know, I mean, that's, that's what happens. And George Crumb's Mundus Conus is, of course, a joke. 
It's charming. He knows. He knows. I mean, we spoke about it. He knows that the pretentious Latin title is a pretentious Latin title because he wrote a bunch of little character pieces about the dogs in his life. And he had lovely dogs, by the way. I mean, I met a couple of them. And, and he performed this piece when we gave him a Lifetime Achievement Award um, in, in Cannes, France, at the Cannes Classical Awards. He played percussion. Um, I, I lent him my maracas, which he really liked. And uh, David Starobin was the guitarist. Um, and this, this, it was a charming concert. We also did Black Angels. and oh, We had a fantastic time. It was a wonderful, wonderful um, event organized, you know, by Bridge Records to bring Crumb over to to Cannes, and you know he's he's gone now recently. Brilliant, wonderful, warm, witty man who wrote fabulous music. So a dog's world is lots of fun. And then after a dog's world, oh yes, of course, William Alwyn Symphony Number no. Five, Hydriotaphia. I mean, that one just blew my mind. It's sixteen rather somber minutes of, of um, well, you know, it doesn't really have tunes, but it's not really atonal and it's very short. And Hydriotaphia was an essay. William Allen was an esthete. I mean, he was just an esthete. He and his wife, both of them, who was also a composer. Um, her name was something like Doreen Carewithin or something like that, or I don't know. But they, they, he, he had elevated aesthetic sensibilities. You know, his opera, Miss Julie, based on Strindberg, you know, it was, it was very tasteful. And Hydriotaphia was apparently an essay by some guy on, on burial or, urns, burial urns in Norwich or something like that. And he wrote a symphony about it. And, I, <laughs> you know, I have no idea what a Hydriotaphia sounds like. I can't judge the success of the symphony. Like I said, it's only about 16 minutes long. It's a very enigmatic piece. Um, and so is the title. Does it live up to it? Well, I think Alwyn was a pretty terrific composer. And I enjoy his symphonies very much. So, well, you know, if you know the others, then you'll kind of like this one. But it was like, hmm, okay. Then we have William Grant Still, Symphony Number no. 4, The Autochthonous. I mean... Really, <laughs> I mean, is that isn't that isn't that the ticket? The ticket to popularity. It's like, oh, from the New World, the Scottish, and then there's the autochthonous. Well, autochthonous means local or native, something that springs from the soil without having been influenced from elsewhere. And it was Still's effort to create, um, you know, a, a a genuine American music based on not any particular folk tunes or anything, but the stylistics of American music. It's a lovely work. Absolutely. William Grant Still's symphonies are beautiful. Um, and, you know, they all you know, participate in that sort of um, Afro-jazz classical fusion kind of sensibility, which we hear in Gershwin and we hear in other, you know, African-American composers like Florence Price. Um, but they're splendid pieces and they deserve to be performed. But I got to tell you, if you want your symphony to be performed, don't call it the autochthonous. I mean, I just looked at that and went, no, how could you do that to yourself? Okay, anyway. Poulenc, Les Mamelles de Tiresias. Tiresias breasts, the kazangas, the titties. <laughs> I mean, that's basically what it is. Tiresias is titties. That's how you ought to translate it into English, I think, because it's a funny, funny, absurdist little opera buffa that sort of, you know, sticks, pokes fun at women's lib. Tiresias, you know, has breasts, which are actually helium balloons, and she has, gets rid of them, and they float upward, and then her husband has 20,000 children, and it was written in the wake of World War II um, to ask the French people to begin reproducing because they don't have enough children to replenish the population after the depredations of the war. Nobody was amused. Let's just be clear about that. But nowadays you can, I mean, it's, it's hilarious. The music is beyond charming and brilliant. The story is crazy. And how, I mean, you only hear the title in French because if you said, oh, it's Tiresias's titties, who would, who would go to the opera to see it? But it's really, really funny and just a work of flat out genius and a wonderful counterpose to Dialogues of the Carmelites, which came next and was a 
totally different. I mean, a grand, tragic opera, just fabulous. And always with Poulenc, when he's setting words, the music is, is so fabulously attuned to the, the nuances of the text. It's just delicious to hear his singers sing French to his music. It's just something perfect about it. I just adore the work, and you will too. And just think of it as Tiresias' titties, and you'll be, you'll, be, you'll be right in exactly the mood that you should be to enjoy it. So after Poulenc, Honegger, the monopartita. Now that sounds like a disease, doesn't it? You know, mononucleosis, something like that, you know? It's the monopartita. What is a monopartita? Well, a partita is a Baroque suite in multiple movements, um, each of which, you know, or many of which are dance movements. I mean, generally speaking, that's what a partita is. The Bach partita is for keyboard, right? You've got a big prelude or overture type thing and then a bunch of dances, you know, Allemand, Gigue, Courant, Saraband, that kind of thing. So a monopartita is a dance suite in one movement. And it, that's paradoxical, but the everything is joined together in a continuous stream. So it really is a mono, a single partita, a one movement partita. Make of it what you will. The music happens to be delightful. I enjoy it very much, but you know, the title, oh my. I don't even want to like scratch yourself, right? When you see it, oh God, it's the mono partita. You know, it's like, you know, get me some, get me some cortisone. And, spray or something or take a pill. Yes, so there we go. And last but not least, one of my all-time favorites, Bax, yes, from the planet Baxia, the nympholept. I mean, nympholept? Hmm? I mean, it obviously sounds like nymphs, as in nymphomania. I mean, you could have called it that too, nymphomania. But nympholept means means possessed by nymphs. And I did a video on why being possessed by a nymph is a bad thing. So if you want to take a look at the music chats and just do a little search on my channel homepage under nymph, and you'll find the, the talk, but nympholept, I mean, you know, there's another one of those titles. It definitely sounds like something you should be in, in psychiatric care for. You know, I suffer from nympholeptia or nympholeptosis or, you know, you know, it's, it's one of those things, but the title is just, oh my God. And it was really funny because, you know, Bax was not a well-known figure until the past, you know, couple decades or so when Chandos started doing that edition of all of his orchestral music. There's so much stuff. And people knew, people knew Tintagel. They knew, they knew some of the tone poems, November Woods, a couple symphonies. Nobody knew how much stuff he'd done. And so you get a symphony and then the coupling, it was like, oh, hmm, <laughs> nympho leapt. Well, haven't heard that in a while, have we? I'm not sure we want to. But yes, it, it is a, it's actually a rather, you know, dark, charming, sexy, fun piece of music. It is. Um, and the title does not sell the product particularly well. But there you go, friends. Ten absolutely wacky titles for ten pieces of music that are really kind of worth exploring and worth hearing. Give them a shot. You won't be sorry. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.